If you follow these tips, these recommendations that I'm going to give you, not only are you going to overcome your impurity, but you will reach the heights of holiness. In this video, we are going to discuss how you can fight the temptation of lust. This is a very important topic. Our Lady of Fatima said that more souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than for any other reason. So we are going to say a prayer before we get started so that I can say what Our Lady wants me to say and you can hear what she wants you to hear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Virgin Mary, you are the queen of purity. We ask for you to be present during this discussion. Help me to say what it is that you want me to say and help these wonderful people to gain what it is that you want them to gain. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Before we get into this, I want to start off with a couple of asides. Number one, listen to this with an open heart and whatever you feel like God is saying to you, take that in. If there's some things that don't apply to you or you think they are not appealing to you or that you feel like they are contrary to God's will for you, that's fine. Discern that. Number two, God loves you. God's permanent disposition towards you is always love. Although when we sin, we might feel or be tempted to think that God hates us, that God's angry at us, that God's going to judge us. And the reality is God never changes. God's disposition is always love, is always attention, is always help. It is we who turn our backs on Him when we sin. We reject the image of God inside of us. We reject what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. I am not going to get into why sins of the flesh are mortal sins, but you should know that any knowing and willing action that is an enjoyment of the sexual passions on purpose, that is a grave sin. The sacrament of holy matrimony is the only place where a man and a woman should be enjoying the sexual passions. Briefly, briefly, why? because the sexual passions are a participation in the procreative power of God. Very important. When we fall into sins of the flesh, our intellect is darkened, our will is weakened. I said we're made in the image and likeness of God. With our bodies, we reject God. There's so much that can go into why these sins are grave matter. We're not going to focus this video on that. We're going to focus this video on how we can overcome these temptations. And finally, in order to overcome these temptations, we have to recognize that these are both biological or natural, although disordered, as well as preternatural temptations. Too often, people get into the habit of saying, well, this is a natural thing, this is a biological thing, there's chemicals, there's hormones, there's growth. That's true. We have a disordered human nature from the fall. We have concupiscence of the flesh. That is true. We also have temptations from the world. Everywhere we go, we listen to music, we watch movies. There's a lack of respect for the dignity of the human person because there's a lack of respect for sexuality. And our culture does not help. It's constantly working against us and telling us to indulge in our passions. The bigger culprit that we often neglect is the devil. We have preternatural enemies that are tempting us normally just through the thoughts, through the imaginations, but sometimes and in many people's cases, often in extraordinary ways where we become diabolically obsessed. It feels as if we don't even have free will. We're just fixated on a particular temptation. It feels, symbolically, as if I'm trying to, to navigate the road of life and somebody's trying to grab the wheel and sidetrack me. That is often a diabolical attack. So our solution, our remedy must be natural. It must focus on our willpower, but it also must focus on obtaining from God supernatural assistance. Now that I brought the big man into it, God, 
Why does God even allow this? This seems like torture sometimes. Why would God allow me to be tempted in such extraordinary ways? Let's be clear. God, first and foremost, respects our free will. When we do things that are diabolical, such as looking at pornography, such as abusing our sexuality, this is an entry point for Satan to enter in. When we commit a mortal sin, we open the door for Satan to come in. We reject God. Again, God never rejects us. But with our actions, I'm saying to God, I reject you. I reject the image of God in my soul. I don't want anything to do with you. We reject his protection. We reject our sonship. Notice that I'm going to be speaking a lot from the perspective of a man. It's because I'm a man. But all of this stuff, of course, applies to women. So God honors our free will. And when we struggle and when we have this fight against our passions, it necessitates, in order to have victory, great, great humility. Humility is the predominant prerequisite for obtaining the grace of purity. All the saints say, when it comes to fighting impurity, the cowards are the winners. Those who say, I'm out, they run to God. Often, our Lord protects us from the grave sin of pride by allowing us to struggle with a vice such as lust that is so humiliating. Every human person, except for the Virgin Mary and Jesus, has this terrible concupiscence, concupiscence of the flesh, and we must cling to God. We must beg God. That's what God wants. God wants to allow us to use this wound of our human nature to bring us to the heights of holiness. And what is that? Through humility. God, I need you. I beg upon you. I depend totally on you. Blessed Mother, be with me always. And what you're going to find is that through this struggle with impurity, through this struggle with lust, you're going to reach the heights of holiness. So God's ultimate goal, the end game, is for you to become a saint. And I give you my word and I will reassure you of the same promise at the end. If you follow these tips, these recommendations that I'm going to give you, not only are you going to overcome your impurity, but you will reach the heights of holiness. And you will go from having been a slave to the devil to being a slave of the Virgin Mary. And instead of you being locked in shackles, Our Lady's going to free you and she's going to use you to free other people because that is the ultimate humiliation for Satan. Not only does he lose those who he's enslaved, but now that former slave is becoming a liberator. So to get out of this, I'm going to start giving you some advice, but you have to be very serious about this. You cannot escape this unless you go all in. Unless you give it 100%, you cannot have one foot in the flesh and one foot with Jesus Christ. You cannot be partially for Satan and partially for God. You have to make a firm act of the will and say, I am going to be free of this slavery. I am no longer going to be a slave to the devil. I am going to be God's child 100% and I will fight with every fiber of my being. I will cut off whatever I need to cut off. And there will be certain things that have to be cut off. Our Lord said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, we're not going to be cutting off our hands or plucking out our eyes, but we're going to have to cut some stuff off. Again, are you willing to do what it takes to live a life of freedom? Are you willing to do what it takes to live a life of Jesus Christ? I'm going to give you natural means and supernatural means. We are going to start with the preeminent supernatural means, and that is the Virgin Mary, and especially through the Most Holy Rosary. When St. Dominic went to the Virgin Mary and pleaded and begged, give us a tool, give us a weapon that will help us to overcome vice, that will help us to bring down the mercy and the grace of God, the answer of the Virgin Mary was this. If you were going to kneel down and pray and say, Blessed Mother, I'm a slave to the devil, please, what's going to liberate me? What's going to free me? She would say, pray the rosary. Now, some of you say, I pray the rosary. It's not working. The original rosary, I'm going to keep saying this, I'm going to keep bringing this up. The original prescription of the Most Holy Rosary was to pray the Psalter, broken up throughout the day. That means 50 Hail Marys in the morning, 50 Hail Marys in the day, 50 Hail Marys in the evening. 
John Paul II added a fourth, and I will say it again. When you pray all four, there's a special grace that is given that is simply not the same as praying three. The people that I know who have struggled with various vices and addictions, who took up the entire rosary every day, went from being slaves of the devil to being slaves of the Virgin Mary, and the Virgin Mary never loses. This is the prayer that in the third promise to St. Dominic is what? You will overcome your vices, it will decrease sin, it will destroy heresy, it will free you from the gates of hell. Three is good, but I'm telling you, go all in, go for the four. You will find Our Lady's grace is gonna overflood in your life. Why is this so powerful? Just briefly, because with every single one of these beads, you're killing your self-will. Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. You're saying the words that were the beginning of the crushing of the kingdom of Satan and the beginning of Christ's entrance into the world. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. You're calling upon the Virgin Mary. You're putting the life of Jesus Christ in your mind. And when you only pray one in the morning, the devil can wait. He can say, oh, this is painful. I don't like this, but I'm just going to wait because I know in the afternoon he's not very pious. He's not very devout. But when you pray this in the morning, you have the protection of the Virgin Mary. Then you come back at it at lunchtime. You have a renewed vigor, a renewed purpose. Maybe you got sidetracked. Maybe you saw some things that were causing your mind to play tricks on you. Pray it again in the afternoon. Pray it again before dinner. You pray it again before bed. Your entire day is Marianized. Your entire day is protected. And what this will also do is this will begin to purify your memory. This will begin to purify your disordered mind. She will bring order to your life. Jesus Christ will be your companion throughout the day. The Virgin Mary will be your companion throughout the day. I give you my word as so many saints have promised before. You will either give up the rosary or you will give up the sin. Yes, you might go a month praying this and then one day you fall. You might, it's possible, it's possible persevere in that and those falls will become fewer and fewer and if you did fall if you did fall our lady is going to work with you to help you to overcome to root out whatever weakness that might be maybe it is a lack of personal discipline maybe it is a need to fast we'll get to those in a moment but she will work with you she will pick you up when you fall she will clean you off this is the prayer according to Padre Pio, of the people who are victorious over everything and over everyone. Trust me, so many saints have become made holy and overcome their vices through this prayer. I've seen it work in so many other people's lives and I've seen it work in my own life. This brings me to the second aspect of our Marian devotion. By praying this, you will have a better sense of the presence of the Virgin Mary. Your goal should be to imagine the eyes of the Virgin Mary everywhere you go. Your goal should be to try and do the will of the Virgin Mary. Say, I'm your slave mother, I'm your child mother, I will go where you want me to go, be with me everywhere. So often we fall into sin, especially sins of the flesh, because we think that we're alone. But the reality is, you and I know, we're never truly alone. God is present everywhere. Your guardian angel is present everywhere. When you're in the state of grace, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you are tempted to sin, imagine Our Lady's eyes. She's looking at you with love. You're looking at her with love. How could you do such a shameful thing when you're in the presence of the Virgin Mary? Your true love, and you will find that you will go from not wanting to commit a mortal sin out of a fear of hell to not wanting to commit a mortal sin because you don't want to lose the presence of the Virgin Mary. You don't want to lose that special grace that you feel, the, all those special favors and benefits that you have from being a temple of the Holy Spirit. The love of Our Lady is so sweet. You need Our Lady to be pure. Jesus came into the world through whom? Through the Virgin Mary. Who has the promise from God to crush the head of the serpent? The Virgin Mary. St. Alphonsus said, as long as you keep calling upon the name of Mary, I assure you, you did not sin. Her name is synonymous with purity. Never was it known that anybody who called upon her was left unaided. Is there going to be a struggle? Yes, but I give you my word, the struggle will become easier and easier as long as you resolve. I'm going all in. I'm not going to quit. 100% the help of the Virgin Mary. She will see to it that you confess quickly and that you overcome this obstacle. Which brings me to my next point. 
the sacrament of confession is absolutely necessary. Make your confession regular. I recommend going to confession once a week. Also, I recommend not confession hopping. Don't avoid a particular priest out of a fear of shame. Find a good confessor, find a regular time, and go regularly, once a week, once every two weeks. Why? So that there's a sense of accountability, so that you have to say to the same priest, this is what I did. And yes, it might be embarrassing, but if you find a good priest, God willing, God will provide for you a good priest, there can be accountability and you can work to overcome your vices. Now, in the sacrament of confession, you must confess your mortal sins, if you have them, in kind and in number. You have to have a regular confession schedule as preventative medicine. When you begin to cut out the root causes of those bigger sins, you begin to make a lot of progress. All too often, a young man or a young woman will go into the confessional and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I committed solitary sin or masturbation whatever amount of times. Or I looked at pornography this amount of times. Again, avoid pornography at all costs. It is diabolical but you will find that you will make more progress if you begin to be more delicate about what sins you are committing first. So yes, absolutely, confess those mortal sins, get rid of them. But you will find that you will make progress if you start to confess venial sins that quickly lead into mortal sins. So for example, let's say you've managed to go the entire week without committing any sort of lustful mortal sin. Praise be to God, that's a great victory, yes. What does your confession look like? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. There was an immodestly dressed woman who walked by. I noticed her, and then I took a second glance, but I quickly turned my eyes away. Accept this. Our culture is full of immodestly dressed people. Yes, they will have to make an account for the way that they've dressed that has gone beyond the permissible minimum. That's gonna be for their confession that they have to worry about. But you are going to see immodest people. We live in a pagan country. All over the television, all over the movies, there's immodesty. Bad thoughts are going to enter your mind. It is not sinful that you happen to see it. That you didn't control it. The thought just came in. The person just walked by. The sin begins to happen when you make an act of the will. The immodest person walks by. You take a second look. When you take that second look, now I've made an act of the will. You just glanced over there for half a second. That, that is a venial sin, but quickly that can turn into a mortal sin. Quickly that can become very dangerous. You can begin to fantasize. You can make an act of the will. I'm going to stare. No, please don't do that. Please don't do that. When you're looking at your cell phone and you're scrolling through, you're just going through the news, you're just going through your feed, and then there's an immodest person. Keep scrolling. Don't look. Don't take a second look, because when you go back and you pull it back down, now you've entered into sin territory. Yes, just a quick look up and down, it's venial sin, but so quickly. Just because some people say, oh, it's just a venial, no. Venial sin leads to mortal sin. Just keep going, avoid that at all costs. But my point is, when you begin to confess that, and you begin to work at cutting that out, getting that down to zero, you will notice you make major strides. You're not even going into those other grave things because you're keeping a close custody over your heart. You're keeping a close custody over your eyes. Purity begins with controlling our mind, controlling our eyes, and avoiding those unnecessary near occasions of sin which brings me to the next aspect of the confessional. When we go to confession, we must make a resolution to try and sin no more. Maybe you're an addict. Maybe the past five times you went to confession, you made the same resolution, you begged God, I don't want to, you fell again. But you have to make that resolution, Lord, with your help, with your grace, I'm not gonna do this anymore, I don't wanna do this anymore. But there's one more step to that, making a resolution to avoid unnecessary near occasions of sin. What does that mean? A near occasion of sin is that circumstance where you might be put in a situation that's easy for you to sin. An unnecessary one is one that I can remove. So for example, let's say that your, your phone is a near occasion of sin. Because you have it, there's so many opportunities for you to look at bad pictures. 
but your job necessitates that you have this particular smartphone, for example. Well, what can you do to uh, remove the unnecessary near occasion? You can put some sort of block, some sort of filter on your phone. Now, in my own life, thanks be to God, I have not been struggling with this with the phone. What I have done, where's my phone? I do and I have struggled with spending too much time on social media, on Facebook, on YouTube, etc. So what I have done is I have handed my phone to a friend and I've made a video about this, so this is not a surprise. I handed my phone to a friend and I said, lock my ability to use Safari, lock my ability to use YouTube, lock my ability to use Facebook, lock my ability to download apps. Now, if for some reason, a diabolical attack were to happen to me and it was to say, look at pornography, look at these bad pictures, look at these bad movies, and I were to go to my phone, I would not be able to. I could hand my phone to anybody and say, here, try and look at porn. It's, phys it's impossible. It's impossible to find porn on my phone. It's impossible to get it even if I wanted it. That is a safeguard to me and to you. Take advantage of that. If your cell phone is a near occasion of sin, and really it is, because you can be using your phone for good reasons. Next thing you know, you're using your phone for entertainment. You're idle on it. You come across an immodest person. Just a couple of clicks away, you're trapped in pornography. You look at pornography one time, the dopamine hits you, your chemical addiction, the diabolical attacks are coming. It's unnecessary. You don't need it. Is it more difficult sometimes to have my phone locked up? Yes, yeah, sometimes I'm not able to look something up. I'll ask, hey, can I borrow your phone? I'll look up their user phone and look up something. But unnecessary near occasions of sin. Maybe that is the computer at home. Maybe that is staying up late. You need to figure out when do you sin? Do you sin after 10 p.m.? Well, get rid of any technology after 10 p.m. You will find that when your life is ordered, when your life is ordered, which God wills, things will begin to fall into place. Your life will become so much better. Another example of a near occasion of sin, let's say you have a girlfriend or you're a girl and you have a boyfriend. What are some examples of unnecessary near occasions of sin? If you're alone together in private. So, it is necessary, if you're discerning the sacrament of holy matrimony, it is necessary that you spend one-on-one -on -one time with the person you're discerning marriage with, because that's how you get to know them. You can't always be in a group where you're never going to get to know somebody. You need to have private one-on-one -on -one conversations. What is unnecessary? Being one-on-one -on -one alone in the home when there's nobody else home. Being one-on-one -on -one alone in their bedroom or in their dorm room. That is absolutely unnecessary. And that is definitely a near occasion of sin, even when you're trying to be good, because when two people like one another, they naturally want to become one. That's why we hold hands. That's why we want to give their other person a hug, because we want to. We are drawn to them. We want to become one. So you have to avoid those near occasions of sin that are unnecessary necessary that you find that you are falling. You don't want to do this. You love your, your boyfriend. You love your girlfriend. You want what's best for them. You got to avoid that and you've got to discuss it. This isn't a video about that, but that's just an example of unnecessary near occasions of sin. Finally, the last supernatural help that we can have, which is the greatest of all supernatural gifts, and that's Jesus in the Most Holy Eucharist. This is gonna differ from person to person, but you know in your heart what you're capable of. Make frequent visits to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. St. John Bosco said that frequent visits, visiting our Lord often, and I encourage you regularly, turns ordinary men into saints. The more time you spend with Jesus in the Most Holy Eucharist, He will begin to transform your soul. All the wounds in your heart, He will begin to, to heal them and He will begin to strengthen you. Whether that's a holy hour every single week, if you can do a holy hour every day, I can't tell you what works for you. I just know that in your mind and in your heart, you have to commit and discern how often can I spend with our Lord in the presence of the Most Holy Eucharist. Mother Teresa said, the time you spend with Jesus in the Eucharist is the most valuable time you'll spend on earth. And then on top of that, if you're a real slave, if you're a real slave, do everything in your power to receive Jesus in Holy Communion every single day. That's so extreme. Do you want out? Do you want to win? 
Do you want to have life to the full? Every Holy Communion you receive, you are united to God. He strengthens you. He gives you life. Your place in heaven is magnified. Every Holy Communion you receive increases your place in heaven. It's going to last for all of eternity. Now, again, you have to discern, can you do this? How often can you do this? Maybe you need to build up. Maybe you need to add one Holy Communion extra a week. But if you're a slave and you want out, if you really, really want out, four rosaries a day, receive Holy Communion every day if possible, go to confession once a week, and that is a recipe for winners. And on top of that, this recipe that I just gave you will give you a plenary indulgence every single day of your life. You'll empty purgatory. You'll go straight to heaven at the hour of your death. Now we're going to get at things that you need to do to build your willpower that are more direct and have to do with the body and the appetites. Fasting is absolutely critical to help you overcome your passions. So yes, the sexual passion is the greatest passion that we have. And sex is a beautiful and a good thing, just as eating is a beautiful and a good thing. But if I begin to control the lesser appetites, what I eat through fasting, through various forms of mortification, that will strengthen me to overcome other passions that I should not be enjoying outside of the sacrament of holy matrimony involving lust. So fasting, I have a video on that. That can mean intermittent fasting. That can mean cutting out a certain food from your diet that you like. That can mean adding a food to your diet that you don't like. You have to do some element of physical appetite mortification. Very important. If you're suffering from a diabolical uh, obsession, because of your pornographic exposure, then fasting is absolutely necessary. Our Lord, as well as many saints confirming what he said, fasting and prayer is absolutely necessary for driving out some demons. The strongest demons necessitate prayer and fasting. So you're praying the rosary, you need to add fasting to that. Whether that be an intermittent fast that is a couple of hours each day, whether that's a 24-hour fast, that is something you need to discern at a later time. But fasting helps you to control your appetites and Again, if you have a diabolical attack, it will help you to protect you from this diabolical exposure. Ordering your life. You can say, man, this is very difficult. Well, what did I say? You want to go all in? You want to win? God's goal is to make you a saint. As you grow in holiness, your impurity, your attacks of lust aren't going to be your primary preoccupation. You're going to be focused on living a life of union with Jesus and a life of union with Mary. And that's going to come through having an ordered life. I have noticed a lot of young people especially fall into mortal sin because they're staying up at all hours of the night. It's time for you to be responsible, have a bedtime, whatever bedtime that is, set it and try to stick to it. It's one thing if there's a one-off where you're going out with friends for a special celebration, a special activity. But you should not be at home idly looking at the internet or playing video games all night because what you do in the evening affects you for the next day, causes you to sleep in, causes you to miss your prayers. Set a bedtime, set a regular wake up time. So ordering your life, giving your life over fully over to prayer is absolutely important not just for overcoming impurity or lust, but to becoming a holy and a good person. You must die to yourself so that Christ can become the one who lives in you, that the will of the Immaculata can be done, and you can be a liberator for other people. So briefly, let us renew. Make a firm resolution to go all in. Be willing to do anything necessary for your salvation. There should be no sacrifice you're not willing to make. There's nothing that you're not willing to cut out. There's no person, there's no electronic device that you're not willing to cut out for your own salvation because at the end of the day that is most important so go all in number two give yourself over totally to prayer offer Our Lady the rosary when you begin to pray the entire rosary you will notice that the diabolical temptations are dramatically reduced your ability to say no and the little things is increased simply because you're killing your self-will throughout the rosary Our Lady promised that you will either give up the sin or you will give up the rosary mortal sin and devotion to the Virgin Mary do not coexist for very long she crushes the head of the serpent 
begin to have a sense of the presence of Mary in your life. Everywhere you go, she is with you. Simply call to mind her presence. Say a little prayer to her. Imagine her eyes are looking back at you. Make regular and frequent confessions. Set up a confession schedule. Yes, if you have mortal sin, God forbid that you do, confess those. But also be particular and delicate to the little things that you normally probably would be overlooking because you're so fixated on the way you jumped off the cliff, but you failed to realize the little steps that took you to walk up to the edge of that cliff. Cut out the unnecessary near occasions of sin. Control your bodily appetites through fasting. Order your life so that you have a set bedtime and a set wake up time. Our Lord has come to give you life and to give you life to the full. When we do not offer our entire lives to Jesus Christ, we keep things from him. We keep him from having a real power and a real ability to impact change in the lives of other people. My brothers and sisters, do not wait to get this taken care of because although it might seem to you to be a very private and personal thing, it impacts every aspect of your personal life. It impacts the way you treat the opposite sex. It impacts the way you view the dignity of the human person. It impacts whether or not you view people as a means to your end. And don't say to yourself, well, once I get married, if I get married, this will all go away. That is absolutely not true. You have to get this taken care of. You must address it and address it now. If you do these tips, I can assure you, you will go from victory to victory. Will there be struggles? Yes, there's going to be struggles. But Our Lady is going to humiliate the enemy. She's going to liberate you and she's going to turn you with her son, Jesus Christ, into a liberator of souls. Let's conclude in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Virgin Mary, we thank you. We thank you for bringing hope to the world. Grant us the graces through your powerful intercession. Intercede for us with your spouse, the Holy Spirit, that we can have every grace necessary to say no to the devil and to fully accept our Lord Jesus Christ with all of our mind, all of our hearts, and all of our souls. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, God love you, and we'll see you very soon.